Um, our next speaker is Dr. Christine Nichols from the Rodale Institute. Uh, I've known about Rodale Institute for quite a while. I, I had friends who worked in the soil science department and the Department of Ecology and Systematics at Cornell, and they were always pointing at Rodale on the sort of cutting edge research that they were doing at the time to try to document, to provide the scientific evidence for, in support of organic farming practices. Um, I'm just going to point you to the, the bio at the back of your program for Dr. Nichols. You can see that she has a depth of uh, academic experience and also field experience working at USDA. She's now the chief scientist at, at Rodale, and we're very lucky that she's here today. Um, you know, when I asked her, she said, yes, of course. One of, the, one of the jokes at Cornell about soil scientists was that they're very humble and well-grounded. So, welcome, <laughs> welcome, Dr. Nichols. Um, yeah, I am uh, uh, very honored to be here. And uh, in reality, um, I am not one that likes the heat. So uh, I, as a child, actually one of my dreams, I was a very strange child. I'm a very strange adult. So I guess that that all counts for good things. But as a child, I uh, wanted to go to Antarctica. Um, not many children want to go to Antarctica, but that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and so I guess I better get there fast because at the rate that we're seeing things, Antarctica may not look the same way that uh, Antarctica looked like when I was a child. Um, so I'm going to be probably one of the faster victims to climate change. I'm not a resilient organism, but I'm going to talk to you about resiliency in the system and how to be able to create resilient organisms and how um, these uh, fascinating fungi and bacteria and all of these organisms have been able to contribute to building that resiliency and um, us being able to tap into that with the way that we manage the landscape, utilizing these regenerative systems and utilizing or organic and biologically based technology to do that. Um, so, uh, as was stated, I, I currently work at the Rodale Institute. This is what our research farm looked like uh, when we bought the Rodale farm. Um, and so this was basically the way that that landscape had appeared to um, Robert Rodale uh, when they purchased that farm. And so you wonder why you would do that. Um, but one of the things that we've been able to do over time is to change the farm to look like this. Um, and again, it's not a fast solution. This is not an instantaneous turnaround, as you can see, but it really does have that capacity to be able to regenerate the landscape. And what we're finding over the research that we've done, we have experiments that have been going on for nearly 40 years now at the Institute. And what we're finding is developing different types of methodology where we could get this to actually happen faster. So the, you know, 40 years that we're involved in regenerating this landscape, now we have some ideas and some data to be able to show that we could actually regenerate landscapes in a much shorter period of time and really be able to address um, what, what Jim was talking about because I think that that's a really important thing for us to be able to do that. Um, I also really loved uh, the videos that Jim had and especially the one in the ocean. And as I'm watching it, I'm, I'm always thinking about things in, in the soil. And um, I love the work that Ian Young has done in being able to get a better idea of how the soil looks. But even in the way that they're sampling in the ocean and collecting biomass and how all of the organisms there are so interdependent on each other. And that's really what we find in the soil environment. And the soil is this foundation to how life is going to be functioning in this system. And so that's really what I want to emphasize um, today. And so what I'm looking at here is this whole idea uh, in 1942, J.I. Rodale, the founder of the Rodale Institute, wrote this on a chalkboard. He basically said healthy soil equals healthy food equals a healthy planet or equals healthy people. And we're extending that to equaling a healthy planet as well. So we're being able to take that with taking that soil health foundation. And that's, again, what it is that we need to be exploring. Instead of looking at everything that I, I, I look at, again, I'm a strange child and a strange adult, everything that I look at is now from that lens of looking at the soil. So I'm watching the pictures in the ocean and thinking about the lens of the soil and how that looks from a microbial perspective and where the fungi are and the roots and the um, bacteria and 
uh, you know, the, the plankton is all of the bacteria that's in there and how the ecosystem is all functioning in that system. Uh, yesterday, as I was walking down uh, to the march, um, passed by a, a building that was going through demolition and saw uh, pieces of concrete that were hanging off um, by uh, some of the building materials there, and I was thinking of roots and aggregates and how this all, you know, is going to be put together. So I had to take pictures of it because I need to incorporate that in the future. But it really has begun to to strike me that nature repeats what works well, and I and I know that in looking at this foundation of the soil and the fungi and um, the fungi that I work primarily with are arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And arbuscular is, uh, literally means little tree-like. And the, the little tree-like, that arbor, we gave them that, as humans, we gave them that label, but they actually did it first. There wasn't trees before there were mycorrhizal fungi. That was something that, that evolved first with the first land plants coming on the landscape. So we take these perspectives of, you know, giving labels to things that we could see and the way that we humanize things. But if you look at nature, and instead of taking that anthropomorphic perspective, look at nature and how nature gets those things to happen, you really start to see the world a little bit differently on how it's gonna be functioning. And the other thing again is I've started to see that in the way that we manipulate utilizing physical tools like building buildings and how that sort of replicates some designs that nature has. Um, so it really is where we are all following sort of these natural laws, even though we don't think that we are, we're really following all of these different types of natural laws in the way that we're working within a system. And that's because we are a part of an ecosystem and an ecosystem is going to be driving us to be able to make these changes to adapt to that ecosystem environment and to be able to live on that landscape. So um, I have uh, some data that I wanted to, to sort of present and talk about um, from the research that we're doing at the Rodale Institute. This is part of our farming systems trial. This trial has been going on for, uh, this will be its 37th year of continuous crop production this year. So it's a very old experimental trial. Um, and what it was designed to do initially was to be able to develop organic management systems at scale to be able to do this on a field scale. So Robert Rodale went to uh, Congress um, and USDA and asked them for help. He first went to the land grant universities and they said, well, you have to do chemical based agriculture. So then he went to USDA and Congress and asked for help and funding uh, research to be able to look at organic agriculture and could you apply organic agriculture on field scale instead of just small farms, could we do this on thousands of acres? And um, didn't get funding for that, so they took their own funding from uh, the Rodale publishing firm. Rodale Inc. is a publishing firm. It's separate from the Rodale Institute. Um, we're a private nonprofit. So they took money. He took some of his personal money that he had gotten from the, the private side of things and set up this uh, experiment where we have two organic management systems. One is an organic manure-based system, so it's basically what would happen if you had livestock in the scenario. And our only amendments in that system are having um, the, uh, in there we've got, our only amendment comes from manure, composted manure. And initially we were adding composted manure on an annual basis. We're now adding composted manure on um, essentially more like a, uh, we'll add compost manure about every three to five years, depending on where we are in the rotation. And so the other nutrition that comes into the system comes from the crops that we're growing, but it comes from the whole entire ecology of the system. So it's what's coming in from the atmosphere, what's coming in and being cycled through that soil environment, how those crops that are growing are impacting getting the nutrients and being able to maintain the water cycles. And then we have uh, the next system is an organic legume system. And so this is if you don't have cattle, but we've got uh, a shorter rotation, uh, fewer crops that are in there. So more often you're going to have a scenario in which you're going to have a legume based crop or cover crop. And that again is the only way in which we're getting fertility added into the system. And then our final system is a conventional chemical-based system. 
What we found over the years with these systems is actually there's no difference in yield. So there's a lot of data that goes out there and says, you know, organic can't feed the world. And the reality is, is that it can. Anytime you make a change in a system, conventional farmers that have converted to no-till will tell you this. Anytime that you make a change in the system, odds are most likely you're going to have a yield decline initially. It's going to take a while for the ecosystem to come back into balance. That's the way that the systems function. And you could put on a whole lot of inputs to try and get that to change more quickly. But the problem is, is when you're adding a lot of inputs into the system, it actually is setting you back. It's not advancing you forward because you're not allowing the ecology to balance the system. So the more that you're adding into the system externally, the more that you have to continue to add into the system externally. So what we're trying to do is achieve a way in which you can make these changes in the system, introduce them, and then allow them to be able to have the time to look at being able to feed the world. And so as we're addressing issues with climate change and trying to put more carbon in the soil, the other things that we need to be looking at is how can we design systems, one, that are adaptable to climate change because whether we start, the young people start today implementing, we start implementing today what Jim was talking about, we're still going to be facing days like yesterday where the temperature in Washington, D.C. was historic. Uh, you know, all of these things, this is the reality that we're going to be facing. We're still going to be facing the climate that, that Jim was talking about where we're losing water. We're still going to be facing an environment in which we're going to have continuous acidification of the oceans. It's going to take a while for those things to resolve themselves. So what it is that we want to do is be able to design things in a way that we have a system that's resilient against that adversity, but then is also helping to contribute to mitigating climate change by sequestering more carbon and also a system that's reducing the amount of emissions overall because we're not going to have the emissions for the production of the chemicals and the application of those chemicals. And we're also not going to have as much emissions. We can work on designing a system where we're not going to have as much emissions from the biology that's in the soil. The reality is, is and, and I've, I've spoken to several groups talking that we're you know, having an emissions discussion. And one of the things that I said, it, I was one of the last speakers at, at this conference, and I sat around and they were all having this debate all day long about you know, trading emissions from one area to another and one industry to another and how you could do all of these things and everything. And I said, if you guys are really serious about cutting back on emissions, you have to stop breathing right now. Because the reality is, is that as organisms, biologically, the, us, the beavers, the, the, the fish, the uh, algae that's in the ocean, um, the microorganisms in the soil, they respire. They do energy. They're giving off CO2 or they're giving off methane. They're giving off chemicals that are going to adversely raise greenhouse gas levels. We have organisms that are giving off nitrous oxide, um, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas in our agricultural systems. This is true. We're not going to be able to stop all emissions. And so, you know, that was great with the scenario that Jim had was it wasn't about an emissions discussion. It's about what it is that we can do. So we're not going to be able to stop all emissions. Reality is, is you can't do that with living organisms. Even if we were all gone, there'd be bacteria that would be here that would do that. So we, what we need to do is we need to be able to set it up in such a way that we're going to reduce the amount of those emissions to a level where they don't necessarily have to happen or that they're going to be cycled more rapidly in the system that they exist. And so that's the idea behind designing these various types of system trials. And so what we've seen over time, again, in addressing this, I think one of the biggest things that we're going to really be seeing, we've, we're seeing it now um, more globally, but we're seeing it as well here in the U.S. I was in North Dakota for a number of years uh, in that line, that 100 meridian line. I was on both sides of that line many times. Um, and the difference between the amount of precipitation on one side of that line to the other side of that line is very distinct. And it's very important to be able to look at that. And if you go west of that line, people are currently fighting over water. 
here in the U.S. And that's going to continue to increase. Farmers are buying land in areas in Colorado not to grow more food on that land, but to actually have more water rights. Because that's the way that they can utilize water for irrigation, is how many acres, the number of acres you have dictates how much irrigation water you can pump. They're not actually utilizing all of those acres to grow food. They're going to, they utilize the acres that are most productive and increase the amount of irrigation that they're doing on those acres. What, were, what would happen if they didn't have to use irrigation at all? This is a possibility. These are the things that we can do. So we can keep the you know, system as usual, or we can look at ways to innovate. So these are pictures taken on the same day at the farming systems trial. And you can see how the different systems are going to be managing water. We want to get water into the soil as fast as possible. Every raindrop that falls on the surface of the, the soil should go into the soil. We need to make sure that that is what's happening. And you can improve infiltration rates, like Jim said, with hoof traffic from animals. But you can also improve infiltration, rate, infiltration rates with growing big blue stem, as opposed to growing Kentucky bluegrass. You can change the way in which these systems work because in the video that was talking with, with Ian Young talking about the biology in the soil and how that creates soil structure, that impacts infiltration rates. And so we're going to be able to increase the amount of water that we can get into the soil because those organisms basically engineer buildings under there that have open space, that porosity. And as you can see, if we increase porosity, we can increase infiltration rate, not just of the first inch of water, but of the second inch of water. And so that's the other scenario that we're finding in these areas that normally only get between 8 and 15 inches of rainfall on that other, on the western side of that 100 meridian line. It's not that they get that rainfall in an even rate. They're getting that rainfall that that is coming in several inches at one time and then leaving the system. Or that it's coming from snow melt in the mountains and then not there. So what we need to do is design a scenario in which the water is going to get into our soil much more quickly and be able then to be held in the soil for a longer period of time. And that's what it is that we can do. Now, the last area study there that I'm talking about was some work that was done by William Albrecht at the University of Missouri. And he essentially, and this is what the chemical fertilizer companies utilize still to sell fertilizer. This study, most of this was published in extension publications, and many scientists won't quote this study because it's not published in a peer-reviewed publication. So many scientists won't take a look and say that this is, this is relevant, but again, the chemical companies use this to sell more chemicals. They've been utilizing this to sell more chemicals, and the idea was, was that if you added fertilizer, the corn needed a lot less water. Unfertilized corn needed nearly five times the amount of water to produce the same bushel yield as fertilized corn. Now, there's nothing in what he there's nothing in what's said there that says that that fertility has to come from chemical fertilizer. Yes, that was part of the study that he was doing there, but there's nothing in there that says that that has to happen that way. Concepts like precision agriculture and climate smart farming or concepts that are increasing, there's no reason that those need to be attached directly to utilizing chemical-based agriculture. That's something that we've allowed other chemical companies to sell us on. Those, that's an, an entirely an ecological approach, being smart about where it is that you're going to be growing different crops, how you're going to be maximizing the efficiency of different places in your field with precision agriculture. There's no reason that you need to use pesticides and chemicals to do that. Use ecology to do that. Utilize biologically based systems to do that. So not only can we get the water into our soil, but we can hold the water in our soil. And that this is very significant over time. So we had a period um, in the late 80s, early 90s, where in about a seven year period, there was about five years of drought, and this was at the end of that in 95, you can see these pictures of our organic corn versus our conventional corn. So what we've got here in the organic corn is we had higher yields than we had in the conventional corn. Conventional corn dried up. 
When these fields were first planted, and this is also another thing that, again, we've allowed companies, chemical companies and seed breeding companies, as well as, you know, some research data, I'll admit it as a scientist, we've allowed that to be able to dictate how people look at their potential yield. So in this picture, early on in the spring, these crops were kind of reversed, the way that they looked. The conventional was very green, it looked very lush, it looked like it was gonna be very productive, and the organic looked like it was struggling. And our farm manager wanted to go out there and actually switch the, the signs that said which was which. Because <laughs> he was really stressed <laughs> about the whole deal. <laughs> Luckily, we didn't do that. But the idea is, is that in an ecological approach, you actually want things to struggle. Stress drives innovation, it drives efficiency. And we, we use that in, in the way that we think, in the way that we anthropomorphize things. Being able to have competition drives us to do something better. If you're gonna have the best athletes in the world, don't just sit back and allow for, you know, uh, them to be fed all the right foods and stimulators to be able to increase their muscles. And the, they train. They go where they're working out. They're going to increase the, the distance that they swim or, or the distance that they run or that they decrease the time in which they need to do that. They're constantly putting their bodies under a certain amount of stress. That's how ecosystems function. That's what drives changes in those systems. And so you want your crops to look like they're struggling initially. Because then they're gonna go to the soil and they're gonna say, hey, they're gonna give off carbon. They do a whole little trading thing. It's, it's really cool this the way that this all happens below ground. But they do a whole little trading thing where they're gonna go into the soil and they're gonna give off carbon from the roots. And that carbon is then gonna feed the organisms below ground. And those organisms are gonna free up nutrients and at the same time, they're gonna engineer habitats, they're gonna engineer pellets in the soil that's gonna increase porosity. All of those things are gonna to contribute to the productivity of the crop at the end. But much of the research data and much of what the, the companies will tell you and the seed breeders will tell you is it's all about what happens initially in the growth of the plant. You can actually tell what the maximum productivity that you could have in a field when the plant is, is first growing, in the first few leaf stages, especially with grasses, you can tell what they're, you can take a little piece of the leaf and be able to tell a look at that and be able to look at how much plants you're gonna, how much potential yield you would have. So your yield potential, what they'll tell you is your yield potential is set in the first few weeks of growth. That's potential. That doesn't, that corn, conventional corn, probably if you were to collect those, the yield potential was probably higher than in the organic corn. But in the end, how it was resilient with the system is the thing that affects things at the, in the bottom line. So we need to be able to marry those two concepts when we're looking at breeding in organic crop production being able to look and select for the best varieties in there in the same way that the conventional world has done that. So that your potential can still be high, but then at the same time, you're gonna be able to have a system that's gonna thrive. And so this was in 2015. Again, we saw this difference between the organic and the conventional system. A lot of this had a lot to do with the fertility of the systems. This was in 2016. Same thing is happening again, sorry. I thought I fixed that. Reverse those. Yeah, uh, this should be organic over there and conventional over here. I thought I fixed that, but um, anyway. So what we want is we wanna be able to have these systems that are gonna thrive. And systems not just with corn, but things like legume crops. That you're gonna have nodules, you're gonna have more root growth in the organic system, but you're gonna have nodules where they're fixing nitrogen all throughout that root zone so that you're able to have, again, building that resiliency and that ability to thrive and how that's gonna be affecting things. 
The other thing that we're doing in looking at this and the things that we need to do in building resilience and the way that we need to look at feeding the world is that we need to have a different approach to human health. Feeding the world isn't about stuffing our faces with more carbohydrates. When we've bred and selected for higher yields and larger grain, what has happened is the plants will naturally put in there in order to be able to achieve what they're genetically programmed to do. In order to be able to achieve higher yields and larger grains, they will take the resources that are least costly. The least costly resource to a plant is carbohydrates because that's what it makes via photosynthesis. So all that it's going to do in those larger grains is stuff more carbohydrates in there. What we want is we want the plants to put carbohydrates below ground and feed the microbiology. So the microbiology is then going to be able to give minerals to the plants and those minerals can be transformed into different biomolecules that are important for human health. We're starting to take the approach in the same way we're learning so much more about our gut microbiology. People are fascinated with gut microbiology now. The gut microbiology and the soil microbiology are one and the same in the way that they function. How this ends up happening, what the scenario is. And so what we need to do is we need to feed the plants that sunlight and CO2 in the atmosphere so that they utilize photosynthesis to convert that into sugars and feed those sugars below ground. We don't need, again, to eat more food. We need to eat better food. We need to have the antioxidants and the polyphenolics and the complex minerals that are there. And so what we're seeing with these trials that we're doing is looking at this idea of how can we combat obesity because of malnutrition. That is what is happening in first world countries. We are malnourished because we are obese. So, not the other way around. Because we aren't eating enough nutrient dense foods. We're eating too many carbohydrates, which are making us. We're malnourished because we are obese. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the wrong carbohydrates. It's the wrong carbohydrates. It's the wrong scenario that you're looking at. So, because we eat too much, we're malnourished. And so we continue to have to eat more. Yeah. Isn't that obesity from malnutrition, not malnutrition from obesity? It can go both ways, but because we're malnourished, yeah, because we're malnourished, we're, we're eating more. But right now, we've eaten so much, which right, right, which leads to obesity. But right now, we've eaten so much as, as a society our, our, because our nutrient density is so low in our foods. Even people who are trying to diet and eat better are malnourished, and that is going to lead to people being obese. So malnutrition so, causes obesity? No, no, malnutrition causes obesity, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. yeah. Um, and so we're also looking at new approaches to pest management, not just in changing systems from organic, from conventional to organic, but within organic, what are some things that we can enhance things better? So a lot of criticism with organic agriculture is the amount of tillage that's done in organic agriculture. So what we've done is we've designed some equipment and changed and modified the system where for us, we do a no-till operation where we roll down a cover crop that's gonna be sequestering carbon while it's growing. That mulch that's created by rolling down that cover crop is gonna suppress weeds and then we're gonna go over and harvest it. Rolling a cover crop, basically we go over the field with a piece of equipment um, and it's kind of like a modified land roller that actually has, uh, they look like um, chevron shaped um, bars that, that stand up. And the idea behind that is they're not, you're not slicing the crop, you're not mowing it and you're not rolling it like we would with a land roller that you're impacting the soil surface so that you're compacting the soil. The idea is, is it's got a drum like a land roller, but then on, on there are these little bars that are going to sit up about this high, are going to stick up, 
and they're separated. They're like bands of bars that you would have that are going to sit up um, about that high and separated by about eight inches between them. And what that does is when that bar hits the soil of the surface, the plant that's sitting there is going to get pushed down against the soil surface, and so it gets little wounds that are created. And because we're separating those bars by a few inches, we're going to create lots of kinks in the stem so that the stems now look like this. And the idea is, is each and every place here, we didn't fully break the stem. We just put a little wound in here. And so what happens when you do this is the carbohydrates will do this at a time when the plant is starting to go through the reproductive phase. So most of the carbohydrates are up in the floral parts up here. The mineral nutrients are down here. To cover wounds, you need to create biomolecules that have oftentimes have a mineral core. To buy the minerals from the soil, you need to pay for it through carbohydrates. If the, if the money is on the other side of the product and you've got to go through the wounds in order to get that to happen, you're not going to be able to pay for those carbohydrates. Or you're not going to be able to pay for the minerals. So what ends up happening is the plant effectively dies. If you were to mow it and slice it, there's just one wound and it, you could get enough resources, enough carbohydrate resources to pay for the minerals you needed to cover that one wound. But because we created a whole bunch of wounds, it's harder to be able to do that. So the idea is, is mowing doesn't effectively kill, but this whole idea of crimping the stem or bending the stem effectively kills it. And then it will lay down there as a mulch layer. And as you can see, even with all of those tillage operations, there was still a weed problem. This is organic, so we don't use any herbicide to manage our weeds. We didn't use any herbicide to manage our weeds. We just used the mulch from the cover crop we rolled down. So we can change the way in which we're managing the system by exploiting biology. The other thing that we're doing here is that we're looking at other ways of doing it. One of the ways we're trying to do is actually breed plants to be able to grow with other plants as companion crops. Reduce the amount of impact of weeds on our crop plants. So we're breeding crop plants that actually will avoid the shade that could be created by a weed plant. I'm trying to select for those varieties. Now, instead of having weeds, you could have a companion crop that actually would help to provide fertility to your cash crop. So there are other ways of being able to take a look at this. We're also trying to manage insects by creating trap crops and insectary strips. So utilizing other plants to actually help to manage insect pests. Those other plants are either going to attract predators for those insects or those other plants are going to trap those insects on a non-valuable crop and not stay, they won't colonize and infest our cash crops. So it's a way of being able to manage, again, utilizing ecology rather than chemical technology. So again, looking at predatory insects that we can attract into the system. We're also looking at how you could manage soil-borne pathogens by coating the seeds, not with a fungicide like it's done in chemical agriculture, but actually coating the seeds with a compost extract mix. We're doing a dried compost extract mix that you can put on the seed, seed coating just like with a fungicide, but that's going to help to protect the seeds from various types of fungi and bacteria in the soil that could negatively impact the growth of your um, cash crops. And then we're also looking at integrating crop and livestock together. As Jim was talking about with the almond growers, taking land out of production isn't going to be the thing that we need to fear the most. The thing that we need to fear the most as farmers is how can you actually make money on your landscape? And making money is net. It's not how much you take to the bank at the end of the season and the, the yields that you have. It's how much expenses you put into there. So again, for the almond growers, if you took 10% of your fields out of production, but you had less irrigation costs, you're in a positive effect. 
So what we did was we took the fields out instead of in a four year rotation, instead of in a three year rotation, we did a four year rotation, took half the landscape into a pasture crop and then utilized the rest of that for growing our cash crops. You could get money from the livestock, but you also got better root growth and better peanut production. So by utilizing these systems, by utilizing biology, we're actually going to be able to really solve these issues. And I think it's really important and it's, it, it is, again, my honor to be able to be a person that can speak for the soil. Because soil can't speak for itself. Soil is not an easy thing to monetize, but soil is the foundation and the most important resource that it is that we have in that system. Thanks.